health. I mean, there's no clear line of demarcation between health and non-health, and, and uh, certainly whatever the government can do, it can't provide anybody health. Uh, that health is ma mainly a matter of lifestyle, as you say, and genes. Um, there is, of course, you know, um, disease, there's uh, accidents, there's all that sort of thing in which medical care is very, very important. The government cannot provide health care, can't provide preventive health care. This, this is all just nonsense and, of course, intended to tax us, to have more control over us, um, to, uh, uh, I mentioned Sarah Palin was right, of course, they do intend death panels. Um, this is what always happens when you have a state medical system. Um, in the Netherlands, where there's a very active state medical system, one of the, one of the categories of, uh, in the health statistics, health statistics, um, uh, on deaths is involuntary euthanasia, right? In other words, they murder you. Uh, so this is, you know, this is, a, this is what the state does, and um, it's death care they're wanting to provide. Um, so thank you, Mr. Obama. The uh, usual fallback of, uh, of statists uh, to uh, the Austrian uh, theory has to do with externalities. Uh, things like global warming, um, you know, whether it's actually happening, whether it is man-made or not. Um, what is the uh, Austrian approach to dealing with such things, externalities. You know, I'd, I'd advise you, I'd recommend Hans Hermann Hoppe's uh, wonderful work on externalities, you know, the, arguing that there are no externalities, or rather everything's an externality. Uh, but there is nothing that, that um, uh, can't be handled by private property. Rothbard's great essay that he wrote for the Cato Journal many, many years ago on pollution, and if you just put Rothbard in pollution, on Mises Org, Google, or uh, LouRockwell.com, this will come up. Um, you know, as to, I don't know, there may be global warming. Certainly, I don't think it's the, even if there is such a thing as global warming, even if it is man caused, and I don't agree with that. Um, the idea that, that we should put the federal government in charge of the world climate mm -hmm. and that it should be, you know, I mean, it just seems to me insane. I mean, it's, uh, um, as we know, government's good at only two things taking your money and killing people. Right? That's it. That's the only two things that it's any good at. So the notion that it can somehow manage the climate, even if such a thing were legitimate otherwise, seems to be just, you know, just... Uh, uh, just to follow up on that, so you envision some um, uh, approach to that that is either an ownership of the atmosphere, private ownership of the atmosphere, or are you thinking about treating um, things like pollution as a, uh, uh, an attack on property rights sure, it's an, yeah, it's of an those attack. that are breathing. Mm -hmm. And if you read Rothbard, you'll see that um, the courts were, in fact, developing this, and the government stepped in to argue in the 19th century that uh, uh, industrial development was more important than people's property rights in a number of um, important cases, and that um, people couldn't sue for damage done to them. You know, the famous case of the farmer whose fields kept being set on fire by the railroad, by the engine going by and spewing sparks out onto his, onto his land after the land had been taken by eminent domain to build the railroad. And the courts ruled, no, no, it's uh, much more important that there be railroads and that you be able to have your, your grain. Well, yeah, so that's, uh, that's the way the state operates. But sure, there can be private property rights in water, in the oceans. Uh, admittedly, there's a lot of development need in this area. Walter Block writes a lot about it. Um, but I'd better sort of take somebody Thank else's you. question. I think this gentleman here, did, uh, did you have one for me, sir? Yeah. Yes, sir. Sorry. Oh. Hi, Dr. Rockwell. I was just wondering if you see any other Just mister, don't promote me, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> sorry? Oh, I'm not, not doctor. Oh, really? I'm sorry. But thank you. <laughs> Mr. Rockwell. Um, do you see any other countries other than the United States moving towards libertarianism? Other than the United States? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are there any other countries that have a libertarian movement growing and moving, I guess? 
I'm trying to Well, I was just talking with, with uh, David Frankie about this today, but I think there's amazing things going on in Asia. Uh, if we look at what's happened in China since the death of Mao Zedong till today, um, probably the biggest, fastest increase in human prosperity and freedom in the history of the world is what's happened in China. Now, it's true they have a fascist government. So do we. Um, they just don't disguise theirs with, you know, talk of democracy and having candidate A and candidate state candidate A and state candidate B that we get to vote for one oppressor or the other oppressor. So they don't, they don't play those games. Uh, so it is a fascist government, but still uh, far more of a capitalistic spirit, um, increasing economic freedom. Um, I think there's m many wonderful things to be expected out of Asia, out of India. Um, what a great thing that the, that, uh, the former Soviet Empire and uh, China and India came into the world division of labor and that all these people are uh, now contributing to our prosperity and their own prosperity. Um, so I think there's, um, my guess is it's, I'd like to think that Western Europe and the United States are going to uh, uh, be the leaders of freedom as they were in, in past centuries. I, I'd love to see it, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm frankly not expecting it. But I think there's many exciting things going on again in, in Asia. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> I think we'd all agree that legitimate national security and defense is a legitimate uh, concern to conservatives. But I never cease to be amazed at how our foreign adventures and <coughs> wasting of resources and you mentioned the state killing people, uh, fighting t two or three wars at a time uh, for no apparent legitimate national security reasons. How is it, how are the people able, how do you explain the ability of uh, influential people referring primarily, I guess, to talk radio, to sell the wasting of our assets on such ventures. I mean, how, how, are they, how do you explain their ability to do that? Because I think the common audience and uh, the average uh, member of the public who is conservative uh, doesn't seem to think about it when they accept it. How do you explain the fact well, it's, that it's, they do? It's a terrible thing. It's the, I, I, I think I guess at bottom I would put it down to the, the tragic and enduring um, uh, appeal of nationalism to people. That um, they think that, uh, you know, we're number one, USA number one, and uh, really I would say the average listener to talk radio thinks of uh, Americans as being pretty much the only humans and nobody else is a human, they're all a gook. And so uh, there are a million dead people in Iraq as a result of George Bush's murder expeditions continued by uh, Barack Obama and um, nobody even knows, nobody cares, nobody, anybody cares about you know how many American soldiers were killed going over there invading their country. Uh, we have a, a, I must say a spectacular war memorial in Washington, the Vietnam the Wall with the, the, the names of uh, 55 or 60,000 American troops who were killed in the invasion and, uh, of that country. But uh, Martin Van Crauvel, the great military historian at, at uh, Hebrew University, uh, has estimated that uh, four to six million Vietnamese and other Southeast Asian civilians were killed in that war. No American knows, no American cares. And those names are not on a wall in Washington. Uh, and it's because, you know, I think it's nationalism. I mean, it's the feeling that Americans are superior. And of course, other countries, there's been German nationalism, Russia, I mean, they're all, you know, many different kinds of nationalism. Right now, you know, I must say, I'm most concerned with American nationalism. And it does seem to give a pass to the government to bomb anybody they want. Um, because uh, how dare they diss us? You know, we're, we're supposed to rule the world. The dollar is supposed to be the world currency. Um, we're supposed to be able to block other people's trade, but don't they dare block our trade? And then, you know, right down the list. Um, nationalism, of course, an important aspect of fascism, which was the uh, winning ideolo ideology of the 20th century, not communism, but fascism won. Uh, 